welcome to the Scam Economy with your host, Matt Bender. They keep on buying the dip, but the dip just keeps on dipping. Folks, welcome to Scam Economy. My name is Matt Bender, and what a week it's been. I mean, there's a pattern here where over the past few weeks, if not months, almost every episode of Scam Economy, I'm opening it up by going, well, what's going on here? What a week. Jeez, everything's been happening. But it's true. Crypto is falling once again. This is just a few weeks removed from the Terra Luna crash. More crypto tokens, companies, and outright in-your-face scams are falling to pieces right before our eyes. And the whole thing is collapsing like I speak with my guests on this episode. That's right, guests, more than one. Like a big old Jenga tower. We'll get to all that and more in just a second, but really quick, because there's so much to talk about. Patreon.com slash Matt Binder to support this show. Subscribe to the YouTube channel at YouTube.com slash Matt Binder, where you'll get live streams and the video version of this show. Twitch.tv slash Matt Binder for the live streams as well. And follow me on Twitter at Matt Binder. And ScamEconomy.com for all the links you'll need, including all the links to the various podcast versions of this show, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. Now, crypto is going down. Bitcoin itself went to lows that we haven't seen in 18 months, literally meaning that since the mainstreaming of crypto, when this all blew up and, you know, your non-tech savvy, non-crypto knowledgeable friends, family members were like, hey, what's this? And decided to put some of their money into it. All of them are underwater right now. They're all at a loss if they were to sell right now. And depending on where they bought, may never be able to sell with a gain ever. Here's a good example. El Salvador's president, Bukele, who I've talked about many times on this show, the supposed Bitcoin holdings that he has which he gambled taxpayer money on, is all in the red. Every single purchase from Bukele of Bitcoin is at a loss. They put more than $100 million in. They got less than half of that worth of Bitcoin right now. It's bad. So joining me now to discuss this huge crypto crash that's occurring right now and the very multifaceted way that it seems to all be falling apart is not just one but two of my favorite people on the subject, David Gerard and Amy Castor. Thank you both for joining me on Scam Economy today. Good well, afternoon. Thank you, for, thank you for having us. Now, now I saw that you both wrote a, a great piece on the matter. You know, I was looking around to see, you know, what the takes were on what was happening, because literally the whole thing is just falling apart right now. It's even it's even worse than what everyone thought was the doomsday scenario a couple of weeks ago when Terra and Luna crashed. And, you know, everyone's focusing on one or two aspects. And then your piece comes along. And I think the both of you really are the only ones I've seen who've tied in I mean, the way you put it is perfect. It's the, the it's a it's a giant building block. It's like Jenga, and someone pulled just one block, and now the whole thing, every other block that's involved, is all coming down with it. Um, David, do you want to start with um, you know you I th I think you wrote about Celsius, which I guess after Terra and Luna would be the the next block that fell. And if, you know we could discuss Terra and Luna. I did episodes on it with uh, Bennett Tomlin of uh, of Crypto Critics uh, Corner and um, uh, uh, Leo Schwartz of uh, Rest of World. But if you want to get jump into Celsius, maybe that's the 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 first thing to talk about in terms of. Uh, the the next shoe that dropped, I guess. Well, I mean, basically the bubble, the retail buyer dollars went home in last June. Miners started borrowing money instead of selling bitcoins because the retail dollars weren't there to buy them without crashing the price. And the whole crypto economy, all the companies, I mean, they're all basically they're the same guys. They all know each other. They're all in each other's pockets. Crypto is not an industry with competitors. It's a single unified casino. And their job is to get your money. Um, so basically, the whole thing was going along, everyone trying to pump each other up. And somehow they let this thing Luna in the door 
Terra Luna, and they had 18 billion supposed dollars worth of stable coins. There was never 18 billion dollars of anything there. Not even 18 billion dollars of cryptos. It was 18 billion dollars of imaginary Ponzi money. Right. And it was obvious that USD Luna would collapse, um, and it did. So it collapsed, and now then I really noticed that the markets lost confidence. I mean, this is anecdotal, right? I'm in a pile of chats with people, people who follow crypto. Some of them are just out and out self-proclaimed crypto degens. You know, they know it's a dumpster fire and they like it that way. Fine. So um, there's a lot, people felt a lot more shaky about stuff because it's like the thing they'd known for about a year now was finally coming true. Um, So it was not so much a case of, would something get worse? It was when it would get worse. So I thought that was about the middle of the end. And I think I may have been conservative in my timing. So the thing is that Celsius were up to here in Terra and Luna. Um, They had a bundle of Luna. Um, So they collapsed. I mean, Celsius was a Ponzi. It proclaimed impossible interest rates you were on flimsy pretexts. Um, that, that, that's the big tip off is the ridiculous interest rates, yeah, you know. Yep. Like I'm 55. When I was in, in the late eighties, I remember interest rates in Australia. I don't know about elsewhere. They were like 18%. So I still have this thing in my head that I think 18% is a reasonable interest rate, even though I know it isn't, you know, but there's be a lot of people my age. We got money now. And we'll blow it on magic beans because 18, 15, 20%, that's a reasonable interest rate. I am owed that rate, <laughs> right. you know, and I won't accept 2 or 3%. I want more. So right. I'm going to put my money into clown penis coin and it's going to be awesome. Right. And so they put all their money into clown penis coin and then they were surprised when it turned out to be backed by a bag of dicks. <laughs> it, it, um, so Celsius was obviously going to collapse. They couldn't pay out money at anything like the rates they were getting in. They started stopping withdrawals after Terra Luna collapsed. Um, People randomly couldn't withdraw. And they were telling people up until the day before they shut, they were telling people to keep putting your money in safely. You can totally withdraw unless we put you in hodl mode, Um, which is amazing because, you know, I love it when my bank – tells me I can't take out my money and uses a children's meme to say so. It's um, great. So then Celsius shut their doors, and now they have announced they are restructuring with the aid of a lawyer. That's a way of saying that your money's gone. Right. Um, your we're, cryptos we're are gone. We're insolvent. <laughs> right. I'd seen some people report that they tried to even, like, uh, uh, pay off their their loan because this whole the whole thing works is just it's, it's a self people don't know Celsius is this lender and uh, by lending out your your money via your crypto you you apparently get what you mentioned these enorm, uh, enormous uh, rates in return but apparently uh, what you really got was nothing and in fact you probably lost whatever you put in there because not only can you not withdraw like your your apparently what you you uh, earned quote unquote. But whatever you left in there in terms of, uh, you know, your, your lending uh, cash. Oh, it's even better, though, because um, Celsius would only pay you the really high interest rates if you took your interest not in whatever crypto you were lending them, but if you took your interest in sell tokens. Right. Celsius' own made up, pulled out of their backsides uh, magic beans, which were only supported by... Ponzi-nomics. People believe they have a value because people believe they have a value. Later investors will surely come off and pay off the early investors. Um, Now, you and I can see a few problems with this, and probably so can your esteemed viewers, but, you know, crypto guys see 20% interest, I'm in. And it's like, no. So, Cell, of course, has gone through the floor. On Monday, after after Celsius shut, sell tokens, bottom out at 18 cents, and then they were pumped a bit, up to about 30 or 40, and it was clearly fake. There was very little volume. Um, nobody wants these things anymore for some reason. And there's people stuck with bags of these things. And the other thing about Celsius was they weren't actually 
these weren't the brightest bulbs in these weren't the sharpest spoons in the drawer um they were clever but not smart um basically they were they talked to a good game for a while or good enough to convince crypto guys and they um did things like they invested in staked ether which is a promise that you'll get ether out of the ether committed for ETH2, the proof of stake test net for ether, and that'll definitely happen before the end of time, maybe. Um, and the more you look at it, the less it's substantial, it seems. And they were all in on that. And then, yeah, Celsius collapsed. So Bitcoin then went south with it. I think what happened, I'm increasingly of this opinion that all the whales are in it together because all the crypto companies are in it together. I think one of them cut and run and just went, screw you guys, I'm out of here. I'm dumping my uh, Bitcoins and getting all the filthy fiat I can get, which isn't much. And that's when uh, it dipped below 21,000, right, David? Yep, yep. And we've been and, and it's almost like they've been it's almost like they've been working to keep um, Bitcoin above 21,000. Mm. Like that's the latest magic number. Because yep. once once it goes below that, I mean, it's like they're trying to protect their their crazy god, right, <laughs> Michael Saylor. Because yes, once it goes, yeah. There's a lot of magic numbers. Um, mm -hmm. Over the last month, since the uh, Terra Luna collapse, they have been um, basically dumping all the alts, dumping all their ether, just to keep the Bitcoin price up. Now, they're also dumping on Ether trying to support that because there's a pile of DeFi borrowing that um, gets called at $1,000 in Ether. Like, there seems to be a bunch at 21000 bit for Bitcoin, 20000 for Bitcoin, a bunch at 19000 for Bitcoin. So these aren't psychological levels. These are people have a lot of money riding on the number being that price sort of levels. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin is hugely manipulated. For some reason, Tether hasn't been printing. That's a thing. That's rare enough. It needs explanation. We think that they are in trouble, and that they can see trouble coming. And I had people tell me, "Look, Tether is now being monitored by New York. It's fine. They won't have a pile of toxic waste and dead babies in their reserve." I think this is false because they are working so hard legally to stop CoinDesk from looking at what's in their reserve through that free of information claim. So they're really afraid of whatever's in there coming out. So that's why I think Tether is really worried about their toxic waste being exposed. And they've been trying to unwind as well. They've been reducing the reserve. I think they're trying to make the reserve less toxic. I strongly suspect Tether only has $2 billion of actual cash oh, wow. and treasuries. Yeah. That's the, amount they had in, that's the amount they had in 2019. That's the amount they had in 2021. They gave attestations showing much larger amounts of treasuries, but I don't know if those were just – they borrowed them for 30 days or something like that for the attestation. Um, for people I who, think the actual money oh, – it's, 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 sorry, I'm getting technical, but it's all a mess. And, right. Yeah. No, absolutely not. For people who are listening and are, maybe they're – you know. They're, they're not someone who, and you know, they got into, you know, I, what, what's happening right now is a lot of people who uh, got into it over the past year and a half, 18 months or so, who, you know, that's when this all went sort of mainstream with this new bubble. And a lot of people like, you know, moms, dads, grandpas, grandpas, people who never had any interest in crypto all of a sudden are being told by their favorite Hollywood celebrities and music stars and, and um, you know, the, 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 the you know, the news uh outlets that they read that this is the next big thing and they got in you know they probably got into it via bitcoin and so they're probably listening to this and thinking you know i i didn't even know what terra luna was i don't have anything invested in celsius why is my bitcoin tanking all with, with, with all because of all these other uh uh coins and companies you know Matt, i think i yeah. i think the important thing to understand is that we've known for a while that um, if you can, you can think of the whole the whole crypto uh, space is it's just kind of being held together by a linchpin, you know, and and when when the price of crypto starts falling or there's something sort of kicks it off and it, it just the whole thing just sort of falls apart, and that's what we're seeing right now is how quickly things begin to fall apart, and even though 
21,000 sounds like a drastic number from people when you when you consider that Bitcoin at its at its record in November was $69,000. So it's lost 70% of its value. Um, but it can actually fall even further than that. You know, I mean, if, when we looked at the last Bitcoin crash, uh, the last high was in December of 2017 and Bitcoin was at $20,000 and people thought that was a lot, a lot of money. By the end of 2018, a year later, it was back down around, what was it, David, about 38, 3,800, 3,500. That's how yeah, far it that. fell. Yeah. So, you know, um, and like in March 2020, when COVID hit, all the markets panicked, everyone dumped everything. The investors who bought just a few percent of crypto, you know, why not? They dumped the garbage first. So they dumped their cryptos. Everyone flew to the most secure, stable, hardest money known to investors, the US dollar. And um, crypto bitcoins went down to about 3,000 and something. That's when Tether really cranked up the printer, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, you know, we that's right. In 2020, that um, Tether started 2020 with about 4,000 market cap, 4 billion, 4 billion market cap. And then in um, it went all the way up to 83 billion, 83 billion tethers sloshing around in the crypto markets, pushing up the price of Bitcoin. Um, by only and then, the finest squirrels and confetti. Right. <laughs> Recently, it's let go of about 10 billion of that. We don't know why, um, but it's almost as if they're looking at their books. Some of these companies are starting to look globally at their books to see what's what can we do. You know, how how close are we to you know complete collapse? Because there's very little real money in the whole crypto system. I mean, it's sort of all been built on Ponzi, on Ponzi, on Ponzi, um, and and there's sort of this incestuous relationship between all these companies. So. Um, yep. it's you just should always all assume they're working together. Down. Right, right. David, you had sent me that uh, that piece from uh, earlier this year, where uh, a bunch of like there was like a, a, a you know bunch of Russian oligarchs were looking to uh, cash in yeah. on their Bitcoin and uh, you know use it it's to hilarious. buy property. Yeah, and one of them apparently had like what was it, a hundred twenty five thousand Bitcoin or something like that, some extraordinary amount of Bitcoin, and they went to cash in, and the exchange was like. You can't do that. We don't. There, there's not enough money to give. We, that's too much. Yeah, they um had. It was a Reuters report on how these Russian billionaires were desperately trying to get money out, so they'd send two billion dollars face value of Bitcoin to their banker at Credit Suisse, who would then try to place the two billion dollars somewhere. They had multiple orders. None was smaller than two billion. Some also tried to trade the bitcoins for property. I mean, for real estate, I'd I'd say that counts as cashing out, you know. But they couldn't even do that. In the in the story, it says none have managed it yet. So you'd think that a literal billionaire would look at say, is my rainy day asset liquid? No, it turns out they didn't. So that's great. Right. So we got we got the Terra collapse basically kicking this off a few weeks ago. And then uh, in turn, Celsius starts to crumble because of their investment into, uh, you know, into Terra Luna. And then that takes another whole chunk of crypto out of the market from all the people who were using Celsius, which, you know, the largest crypto lender in the space. So yep. let, let's actually now move on to what we're seeing with the exchanges, because this is sort of like the front facing aspect of crypto like this is like the facade that's put on like the mask that's put on to go and you know wheel them out in front of the public and say no this is legit these are real companies you know and, and these are these are the uh, you know in terms of like you know it's really interesting to me how much money was put into for example trying to bring more people into crypto via super bowl ads by you know coinbase and ftx and just a few months later, this happens. It's almost like that was their, like, you know, uh, their Hail Mary, ironically enough, was the Super Bowl. Um, so w w what are we seeing now at these exchanges? I've seen that, like, Coinbase is not only laying people off, but rescinding job offers, something that, you know, that's not something that's never yeah. happened before, but it's not something that normally happens either. Coinbase was spending a lot of money. Um, and their stock is actually down to $50. I mean, it was at a high around, I want to say, $340. i am not sure of the number, but it's come down ugh, a lot. 
Um, uh, the company was way overvalued and they were just sort of living high on the hog for a long time. Um, they hired, they have 5,000 employees and about 30% of those were hired in the first quarter. And the company's going to let go 1,100 employees. So most of all those employees that they just hired, they're now going to be letting go of. And this is right after um, Coinbase spent about $14 million on a Super Bowl ad. So you can see where the thinking is. They're just not thinking about the future. They're not thinking about uh, future possibilities or they're sort of just behaving irresponsibly. Um, and they got millions of dollars in, in investor backing too. Um, what was the latest evaluation of that company, David? Do you remember? Um, Coinbase? Yeah. I'm not sure. But um, I, let me see. I forget. It was a it's, lot. I'm just looking at this thing that says they actually debuted at $381, went up to 430 on the day, closed mm -hmm. that first day at 310, sorry, at 328. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of been steadily downward ever since. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As because it was a direct listing, not an IPO as such, there was no lockup period. That meant the insiders could just dump on retail immediately. And they did. Now, and they did. The four top But they filled in their SEC S1 form, so it's all entirely legal and above board. <laughs> right. So the four, the four top executives at Coinbase made about $1.2 billion selling coin. Actual dollars off the actual, actual markets, dollars. by the way. Yeah. Not oh. cryptos, but dollars. Oh, interesting they didn't take that money in crypto, right? I mean, hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's like they um, Coinbase has been spending like – a drunk startup, you know, mm -hmm. like they hired 30% of their staff in just the first quarter of this year. Then I don't know what and, happened. And, and I, David, also, we looked at on the SEC reports in 2020 and how much some of these top execs are making. And I recall, um, $60 million with benefits for Armstrong. Yeah, $60 billion for Brian Armstrong. $60 so million. He's not $60 sorry. Million, sorry. But mostly his money 60, is inside a 60. stock that he owned as a founder. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's like, I am hypothesizing that someone at Coinbase actually looked at the transaction rates, went, holy crap, we've got no transactions. Our income is going to die. We need to stop spending money at the rate we have or we're going to go broke. That's because they yeah. had about $4 billion cash on hand. They were spending maybe a billion a month on garbage right. and they were going to go broke if they didn't stop. So now they've stopped. So actually they've got some chance to survive. But, to drag it out a little bit longer, but it was like they just sort of slammed into reality. You know, it yes. was like this isn't how companies should be run, right? The, there's some sort of thinking or planning ahead, or maybe Bitcoin won't always go up, but it gives you an idea of how some of these crypto companies think. They're all based on the price of Bitcoin just going up and up and up and up. Right. I mean, that's yeah. that's sort of what's like instilled inside of them, right? Like no matter what happens, the one constant will always be number goes up. It's, mm -hmm. it, there was a thing which um, I saw a poster on something awful detailing this, pointing out that the trouble with crypto companies is they cannot be rational about the crypto market. They, it's impossible for them to be because they're crypto companies. They have to be long on crypto by definition. A stock mm -hmm. broker doesn't actually, they prefer stocks to go up because they get more customers, but they make money whether they go up or down. Mm -hmm. And an exchange makes money whether it goes up or down. They like transactions too. You know, a hedge fund can make money with the number going down. Um, that's fine. Um, if it's a big disaster, well, that's another thing. But crypto companies have to be long on crypto. They cannot be attitudinally short on crypto. Crypto hedge funds can, but then they've got counterparty problems. It's tricky. Um, mm -hmm. so they cannot be rational about this stuff. Coinbase has to be long on crypto, right. even when it doesn't make sense. So that's why you're going to get a lot of weird, not quite rational behavior. Also, I think these guys don't understand that they're now in a much more demanding regulatory environment. When you're a public company with retail equity, um, you just can't pull a lot of nonsense that you could before as a privately held crypto company. Like you just can't. You know, you have to account to the shareholders and you can be sued for all sorts of things or the slightest material misinformation. 
material information, misinformation, you'll get in the poop for that, you know? <laughs> you can't lie to people, which is quite a good rule, it turns out, you know? Um, so I don't think Coinbase is handling the responsibility of being a public company all that well now that times are going bad. They'll probably cope. They're not actually stupid. They do actually have lawyers. I assume that every statement they've made in an SEC filing is factually correct. Um, that yeah, sort they of have thing. consultants and people come in. And yeah. I, I sort of have this picture of one a consultant walking in mm. as the price of Bitcoin is diving and saying, you know, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> no, you've got to stop all hiring and everything like that. And I almost imagine like between the two weeks when they announced that they were going to freeze hiring to um, and they were going to kind of take a look at things. And then two weeks later, they came out and said, no, they're going to just rescind offers. And then then shortly after that, hey, we're going to lay people off. It's almost like somebody came in and started looking at the books and said, you know, what the hell are you running here? Yep. You, know? right. you can almost see that, you know, happening, you know. You know, that's a, that's a, you know, absolutely. And he also, uh, the CEO of Coinbase also went on this like unhinged Twitter rant against his own employees because of like some like internal discussion on Slack or something about. Just well, Brian before Armstrong has always been sort of unrealistic of the opinion. If you don't like it here, well, you should just leave. Right. That's, Which his, is always been, a... that's been his attitude. You don't, you don't like that. You're not happy. You don't like the politics. Um, you want to complain about the company. It's sort of this real narcissistic attitude towards other people where there's just there's not a lot of empathy. You know, he's 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 very comfortable. He's made a lot of money. But when it comes to other people, he's just real short on sympathy. That's not how you treat employees. It's not, you know, rescinding offers. It's just that's a, that's a good way um, it's made to make sure in that the tech world. Like right. they weren't it's already like bought a crypto company. You just you just made sure that that, that, that nobody's you know going to want to work for. You. And they were paying top dollar for software engineers. They know? were paying a sweet. They were paying like Facebook, Google levels of pay very, for good engineers. Very attractive, remarkable offers. packages. Yeah. Wow. Because they were trying to get people away from Google and Facebook and and all that. So they they made very attractive offers. And they managed it. What's that? They managed it too for a yeah. week. Or a day. Yeah. <laughs> but Armstrong has always had troubles with employees having opinions. Um, there was like, a, he forgot that Bitcoin was founded by libertarians. So, like, Coinbase did things like they bought um, a company called Neutrino, a security consultancy that was previously called Hacker Team and used to sell services to dictators to. Um, mm. track journalists and dissidents. And it, it turns out that libertarians do, in fact, have libertarian principles. And a lot of people inside were very unhappy about this. When Armstrong talked about politics a year or two ago, that's what he was talking about. Right. Or when Coinbase well, signed on with, with Facebook for Libra, a lot of people were really upset about um, signing up with the great big surveillance capitalist data hoover. You know, they well, he was he was paying happy. enough money where he could get no coiners, people that had different political views that would come work with because, you know, they were enticed by the and seduced by by the amount money. of money. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, your point to how, you know, the crypto exchanges are different than like the stock brokers and such is like even like just think about like you go on like a, a stock broker, like a stock exchange website or whatever, even even like Robin Hood, the most basic and they have terrible yeah. practices, too. But they'll even they'll, they'll they'll like show you like even like an analyst opinion of like what stocks you should stay away from, which stocks are, are you should you know hold or buy or sell. There's none. I, I mean, I haven't seen it. Maybe there is an exchange out there that does it, but I've never seen that on any crypto exchange. They don't tell you to, they're just all right there and have fun. Try to figure out which one to buy as long as you're buying. Exactly. They, um, I mean, the pressure on the exchanges, it's not just Coinbase. A lot of other exchanges, Crypto.com, Gemini, BlockFi, who are another Celsius. They're letting people off, thing. right? Because they're not making any money. Yeah, they're laying people yeah. off. They know transactions are down. They know the business is becoming less sustainable. At least they're laying them off, you know. Um, they're laying off. And, you know, David, the one thing, you know, I think it's important to note is that also, you know, in the last two uh, times that Bitcoin crashed in 2014 and 2018, um, we saw some big exchanges go belly up, Mt. Gox and then Quadriga. And that was the big story in 2018 going to 2019 was Quadriga you know, going belly up. 
Bitfinex right. did actually go belly up, but then they tried to trade trade their way out by um, giving That's people right. Binance the, they security tokens Bitfinex. and tethers. Right, tethers. Bitfinex, which, right. which which is which Bitfinex, which is the, the the sister company to to Tether, the one that's issued um, all those billions of tens of billions of stable coins. Um, the reason that yeah Tether got started was because. I mean, really got started issuing um, stable coins is because Bitfinex was essentially in, insolvent after it was hacked. Yep. And and, and Bitfinex's yeah. way out of that was to create, you know, new new money out of thin air, and that's always how Bitfinex has solved its its financial problems. And if you look at at at, at Quadriga, I mean, they effectively are also creating money out of thin air. I mean, with Quadbox, I mean that the largest exchange in Canada at the time. They couldn't deal directly with the banks. So you would have an account on, on, on Quadriga and you would see dollars in your account, but they were not real dollars. They were just representative of real dollars and they were called um, quad, quad box, right? Quadriga box, quad box. Right. For, but, any, but, for anyone but, listening who isn't sure what Quadriga is, you've probably heard of it. It's the infamous crypto exchange that went belly up after the CEO died, basically taking the entire company down with him right. because he didn't share the, you know, the, the, the keys or whatever with anyone. He basically took everyone's well, money. It wasn't, it wasn't even that, Matt. I mean, there, that, that was sort of the story, the narrative that came afterwards. It was the largest crypto exchange in Canada. It turned out later, we learned, um, because we had a great deal of insight into what was going on in that company um, after the investigations took place, was that that Gerald Cotton, the CEO, was running the entire exchange like a Ponzi. There was no oversight on that exchange at all. There was no, nobody had any idea what was going on. Everybody assumed that he was just operating things on the up and up, but he was creating accounts. He was issuing fake money into those accounts. He was doing whatever he wanted to do. When, when the price of Bitcoin started to go down in 2018, he couldn't keep up the Ponzi. He couldn't give, people were trying to withdraw cash. They were trying to withdraw crypto, right? And that should have been easy. Um, and, and, and they weren't getting their money out. Yeah, so those were the first right. red flag. But it was essentially run like a, a Ponzi. So um, you can see when, when the markets start to go down, it's, it's like a big shakeout for these operations that are effectively, uh, you know, running like Ponzi. There is, they have very little real money. And, and, and we believe there's just very little real money in the entire system. And, and we're seeing, <laughs> we're the seeing. The same thing happened to Enron, right. Worldcom, right. Bernie Madoff. It's Bad not times economically showed exactly how uncovered they were, how and, open they were. And that's why a lot of those, you know, those theories and, you know, uh, accusations of the CEO of Quadriga basically faking his own death because there was a whole scam that was running and he needed, you know, he need they need, they yeah, was assumed that they needed was, to fake his something. His Ponzi yeah. was collapsing. Right. His Ponzi was collapsing. So he had two choices, right? right? He could either turn himself into the authorities or he could disappear, right? He disappeared. Right. So right. it's not clear if he's a dead or alive, but the fact it's even a question should tell you that, um, you know, yeah. it, it's quite an amazing thing. So I mean, how, but, how, are, yeah. how are the other, you know, major uh, uh, exchanges currently dealing? Like I know, interestingly, the Winklevoss twins have decided now would be a great time to uh, go tour with their cover band. Just really interesting how that worked out. Uh, <laughs> now is a good time to focus on their cover band and literally play concerts. Uh, and I read somewhere that like Gemini all of a sudden on their customers just brought up the fact that they're going to be accept uh, taking uh, fees in certain areas where previously there were no fees and i know you know is crypto.com going to still be able to pay their end of the bargain for the uh crypto.com arena there they put you know spent millions well, of think, dollars i think i think that the i think if you look at the entire system there's not there's not a lot of cash in it so um when when if something happens if for example tether um if if the department of justice came down on tether if the remaining assets were frozen if suddenly the price of tether became nothing what would happen um, well, on the overseas exchanges, 
um, people would just flood into Bitcoin, right? Um, get rid of their tether, get rid of their altcoins, and then try to get over to one of the um, bank exchanges like Coinbase and the others and, and get out through, you know, basically a mouse hole. Um, so you kind of have to look at the exchanges that that do have banking and how you get what what do you we don't have any we don't have any any clarity into what's going on in the, the offshore exchanges like Binance, Bitfinex, um, and um, so but we do have some on some of the U.S. exchanges, for example, um, that do have connections with the the traditional banking system. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens as everything sort of shakes out. I don't know, David. What's your what's your thoughts on yeah. that? So, firstly, crypto is the entire single system. It's not competitors. The onshore exchanges in regulated jurisdictions are the cashier's desk for the casino, but the actual casino is Binance, Huobi, FTX, and so right. on. The offshore that's exchanges, where the price. that's where all the trading happens. Mm-hmm. Regulators in the US can say, we're going to regulate crypto, but if they just regulate Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken, that doesn't do anything because the market right. is actually in the offshore exchanges. That's where right. the action happens now those that's they, where the prices are set. That's where the price yes. of Bitcoin is determined. Now they don't have good access to US dollars. They have access some sort of access to other fiat currencies, like I think Binance has access to Euros and British pounds and Australian dollars and stuff like that. And there's a lot of Australians who they absolutely skinned in uh, crypto hmm. who didn't realize they were sending their money off to some offshore casino. But um, they literally have no regulation. The only constraints on the offshore exchanges are don't violate sanctions and they drag their feet on that, you know, like Binance. That, there was a big Reuters report that Binance was basically cashing out a buttload of sanctioned entities and drug dealers and it was fabulous. But um, they denied everything, I should note. Uh, <laughs> they said that Reuters just did a special investigation for clickbait. Right. <laughs> Because Reuters do that all the time. So um, these people have no constraints on them right. except scaring off the suckers and the high rollers, their mates. Mm-hmm. Now, the suckers and high rollers, the, they bring in the suckers and the high rollers skin them and that's the business. They have to make sure that the people can get their cryptos out when they want to. The only thing is they're not allowed to scare off to spook the uh, suckers. That's the only rule. Um, Binance, we're pretty sure Binance trade against their own customers. There have been studies to this effect, proving that they, they must halt, have... they halted. They halted withdrawals of Bitcoin too, David. Yesterday, yes. Yeah. They, they came up with some weird excuse. Uh, we have a stuck transaction, so we're shutting off Bitcoin withdrawals. There's a Bitcoin stuck like, in the tubes. Someone's going in and get the plumbers. Like, if you send a Bitcoin transaction with too low a transaction, it gets stuck in the queue, and they didn't, like, send it again with a um, replace-by-fee transaction where you send the same transaction with a bigger fee. Um, it was like the excuse was implausible bullshit, right? Yeah, it right. was it was a fake excuse. They just right. went, we're cutting off Bitcoin withdrawals basically until the market calms down. What, why know? do you think they did that, David? I don't know. I seem to calm the market down. Probably to calm to calm the market down because that would that's one of the ways that. Do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, when, doesn't when seem to have of, worked. But yeah, that's they, they probably want, yeah. These exchanges want to make sure they want to sort of they, they want to make sure there's not a, a panic selling because panic selling could just. <laughs> but Bitcoin is tra- the markets are so thin that it doesn't take much to sort of just. You know the price could just plummet, you know, one day or go up. So, so they try to do, mm. they try to control that amount of trading. So I, I think that's one of the reasons that they, they halted the withdrawals. Right. Ocean scheduled maintenance is the usual excuse. So Binance did actually come up with a new excuse. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, congrats guys. So <laughs> Maybe one for, I mean, uh, for future <laughs> use too, depending on how uh, far that future goes. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So these guys, they work through, the uh, onshore exchanges as their cashier's desk because if you want mm-hmm. us dollars you make your you trade your way to lots of bitcoins on binance you send them to coinbase and you cash out in dollars 
because no. you find some sucker who will buy them for dollars. Because remember, of course, every dollar a winner makes, a loser lost, and early winners can only be paid from late losers. Right. Uh, speaking so, of speaking of of suckers, uh, I've seen this company uh, being uh, you know name dropped a lot recently, and you you have them in your piece. Describe them as like a crypto hedge fund, and this is uh, Three Arrows Capital. What is yeah. what is there? It's I did see online basically a few uh, crypto uh, promoters and advocates even dunking on the co-founder of Three Arrows Capital because apparently he has uh, invested and uh, p- propped up and uh, promoted every coin or crypto company that's failed so far. Apparently he was big on Terra <laughs> and then he was telling people that Celsius is the way and, you know, one by one, all of their investments, I guess, are collapsing. Where where do they lie in this? Because it seems like they had pretty big holdings. Like what what, what were they even doing? They just, they just like sort of they like Michael- They appear Lord. to be the next shoe to drop. I, I mean, I, I think they do what they all do is they promise ridiculously high returns and then- um, so many people are sucked into that to hand over their crypto, and they think that their money is safe. Oh, so they were, they were they were they were they're they're another one of those lenders. I wasn't sure if they were just like. Oh uh, no, they're not. They're, they're not. a hedge fund. Oh, okay. So we first heard of these guys yesterday, <laughs> and then they go three AC. What are they? Oh, three arrows capital. Who are they? Oh, they were a proper hedge fund in 2012. Then they went all into crypto, ah. and. So I'd heard their name occasionally before, and so we very frantically researched them yesterday. But there's a whole lot of little companies like that. They're basically crypto hedge funds. They are big investors, and they are there to make money for the founders and people who invest in the hedge fund. Right. They're not sort of retail-ish the way that Celsius is. They're sort of – they appeal to basically people who, sh- who should know better. Right. Um, so – that's sort of fine. But on the other hand, there's more of these companies, they're all invested in each other. Like Three Arrows Capital had a chunk of money in Celsius. They had a buttload of money in Luna. They had a pile of money in State East 2. They had, they were all into all the same stuff. And it's like, if one of these companies goes, the others are in trouble. Right. It's like so they it's promise it's these high, high returns on investments, but they're right. they're sitting at a casino. Casino. The investments are just sort of rolling the money right. into these other casino coins, right? Bets and, on the other betters. And the reason yeah. and the reason they're so important in this whole collapse is because they just hold so much crypto. Is that is that that's the reason? Right. right uh, I think it was like 10, 10 billion was the estimate. Oh wow! Is yeah. what I was reading. Lots of deals on DeFi and so on. So in real markets, if you're a systemically important company and you have, say, a few hours trouble because the market's gone absolutely insane, you can actually call the exchange and say, look, don't call us yet on this. We're going to have it in two hours. And you can talk to a human and reason it through. This literally happened um, in March 2020. There was one exchange where I think it was someone from Citigroup was going to be technically in default. But they called a human and they sort of that because it would have been a systemic disaster. Nobody wants that. Um, And so this came out in the FT just yesterday. Um, So that's actually okay because no one was ripped off and the market was kept going. So that's like not awful. In crypto, DeFi transactions are automatic. A smart contract. Computer says no. Computer says you're wrecked. Um, so if you don't magically come up with the money or pump the ether price to keep it above the magic 1000 number or whatever, you're screwed. All your money goes. This leads to chain reaction effects elsewhere with other automatic, um, deals being broken or automatic, um, wipeouts and margin calls. And it's absolute, it's like a slapstick. It's like a huge... Rube Goldberg machine slapstick custard pie clown car where each custard pie triggers three more custard pies and yeah. then the clown's tie pops up and then three other clown's tires pop up and then a great big pile of poop falls on all of them and then they stand up and say that they're clean and everything's marvellous and please send us more money. So they're, That's they're a like technical the next, description. They're like, right. They're, like the, next, they're next, the next shoe to drop and... Um, They'd the kind of gone. Drop. I think we'll see that quarter. They, they, they sort of gone quiet. 
I think they was, were quiet on social media. Sorry, and then they came out. Their their co-founder came out with this kind of vague, cryptic uh, tweet. You know, we are in the process of communicating with relevant parties and fully committed to working this out. <laughs> like right. this he means. said, the guy said, fully committed to working this out with the tone of voice like someone was waving a baseball bat around his knees. <laughs> Right. Yes. All right. I think we'll see uh, David's uh, clown analogy quoted in the next uh, at the next congressional hearing here in the states. Maybe, maybe a congressperson will <laughs> will give it to us word yes. for word. Um, so where where do the Bitcoin miners factor in with all this? You'd think. Um, oh boy. Yeah. Now is not a great time for the miners, and uh, I'm assuming they're going to pull back and start selling off. Which then in turn well, they have, means they have electric. They have got power bills to pay. I mean, yeah. they, they, they in dollars, a monstrous amount of energy. They consume a, a, a small countries or medium countries worth of energy. I mean, somebody has to pay for that, you know. So they have real business expenses, right? So, so they 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 mine about nine hundred new bitcoins a day, and they have to be able to sell those or get the cash somehow, so they can pay their bills and their other business expenses. Um, so, and for yeah. a while, they haven't they haven't even been selling their their Bitcoin. They've sort of been getting loans from their 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 crypto buddies um, so they don't tank the markets. But now they're actually selling them. So it's really interesting because what happened there was this was a bunch of things happening at once. China kicked all the miners out in about May or June. Right. Right. They're still mining in China, but it's it, it's basically illegal and you will get busted. Um, but it's attractive enough that they keep doing it because China has the cheapest commercial electricity in the world. So fine. They then decamped to various poor countries with bad infrastructure like Kazakhstan, um, rebel provinces in Georgia, that sort of thing, where the electricity was cheap, but it had no infrastructure, not really very good rule of law, and You're everyone causing hated them. blackouts. Blackouts, yep. and these countries didn't Jeez. want them there either, so they went to Texas. <laughs> yep. They went to the U.S. and Canada, which had the second cheapest commercial electricity in the world, in a jurisdiction that had rule of law, a decent grid, except Texas, and property rights and stuff like that. And and this is a key thing capital markets so a lot of the miners in the u.s are now public companies they file s1s and and 10 q's and 10 k's and stuff and um it's great you can look up their filings and the great thing about being a public company is suddenly whole vast vistas of lines of credit open up to you that weren't available to you as an ordinary private company or some plebs you know um but even then with, I think they couldn't sell their bitcoins because when I read that miners were stockpiling coins, I went, "Holy crap!" Because I knew what that meant. That meant they couldn't sell them. Last time that happened was 2017, during the Bitcoin Cash Wars. A lot of large Bitcoin mining pools moved to the ultimate Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and this left them um, mining lots and lots of this ultimate coin. Bitcoin Cash never really succeeded in taking over. It's just an altcoin now. One big miner, Bitmain, they've tried to file to go public in Hong Kong, and they had to disclose the fact they had one million Bitcoin cash coins um, in uh, inventory, which means they couldn't sell them. So when I read the word stockpile, I went, you can't sell your coins, can you? And I no, asked the market, around the, the market can't, can't yeah. handle it. There isn't enough cash it would have to crashed pay the, the price. Money. Basically, what you're, that they're saying, there isn't enough cash in the system to pay the miners. So we're going to loan you the money because we don't want you to expose, hmm. you know, what's going on here. So they borrowed money from Celsius, sorry, from Celsius, from Galaxy Digital, Mike Novogratz's mm -hmm. company, uh, from Digital Currency Group, Barry Silbert's company, who own Coinbase, Coindesk and Grayscale, mm -hmm. um, and from Silvergate Bank who um, are a proper bank, but they're also the bankers to crypto because no one else wants to deal with crypto. Right. Sylvia love crypto companies as customers because they don't pay interest. So they can just take the money and do whatever they like with it. And the crypto is desperate, so they put up with it. But um, they were borrowing money because they couldn't pay their bills in dollars. Crypto people tried to tell me that miners had suddenly 
believed in Bitcoin 1 million. They believed in the future. It was going to be great, mate. And for the previous 10 years, Bitcoin miners had been utterly ruthless economic agents. I didn't, I found it hard to believe they had transmuted into moon boys. So maybe they became moon boys because they couldn't not become moon boys because selling the coins would have crashed the market. But I don't know. So anyway, by about February, even the loans were running out. They had to start selling coins. And in the last month, they've been selling a lot more coins, according to Coindesk. So, yeah, um, that's going to be a lot of selling pressure. And electricity is up and um, Bitcoin revenues are down. Mm. And a lot of inefficient mining hardware is getting shut down. And you can visibly see the hash rate going down. And mm -hmm. it's, which is good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, Bitcoin mining is a business that should not exist and it should be abolished and destroyed and banned. Absolutely. Uh, and they and should the big, all be in jail. They won't I, be, but I they think, should be. I think the big, the big picture is there's not enough cash in the whole crypto, crypto system. Um, the whole cryptoverse has always been sort of looking for ways to draw more cash into the system. And right now, the big problem is that Bitcoin is, is going down in price. And there, there's not, there's no way to really get more of the needed cash in right now. And you've got things happening like the miners are selling their coins. Uh, Mount Gox that crashed in, um, in 2014, there's 140,000 Bitcoins that um, the bankruptcy lawyers and the bankruptcy is going to give back to the creditors. They're going to want to sell those right away. Right. I was going to bring um, that. I was going to ask about that next. Yep. That's going to be, you know, that's going to be, you know, if that happens anytime, I mean, anytime it's going to be incredible to see, but you know, you in the current being market, the creditors, you've, yeah. you've kind of missed the whole crypto boom. You're watching the price go down. They're going to be like, we're not going to miss. We, we want out of this. We want something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, would, you know, it would never yeah. have worked. It would never have worked. Even if it was at like the peak of $69,000, if they tried mm -hmm. to sell the coins, it would have crashed the market. And of course, they would have sold the coins. 140,000 coins go to Mt. Gox creditors. They're going to sell them five minutes later. Right. You know, of course. These are, are people who already got screwed by crypto in uh, almost a decade ago when Mt. Gox went under. So they don't have any trust right. in holding the crypto anymore. They're all looking right. at the coins and going, I'm going to be rich. But of course, the exits are going to be blocked by people trying to get out of them, and they're not going to get A lot rich. of people no. crawling out, you know, little tiny mouse holes. What happens? Right. Um, you know. And, and the so, other thing is, there's, yeah. sorry, I was going to say, the other thing is right now there's a lot of hope being pinned on um, the SEC approving this Bitcoin ETF so that that Grayscale, um, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust can, can convert into an ETF and if that happens, then the hope would be that there'd be some more cash coming into the system. Because right now there's no retail money coming in. Who is going to want to buy Bitcoin right now? So, um, and and obviously there's almost zero chance of the SEC approving that application. So it's just going to yeah. be a tighter and tighter squeeze. I think that's... Yeah, right. like Grayscale's way of dealing with the SEC was to think, we'll get our customers to spam them. So they put up, like ads in like Amtrak stations, like buying every ad in the station and stuff like that to say, send in your comment to the SEC. So the SEC got thousands and thousands of comment letters from the public. And some of them were so enthusiastic that they didn't even bother editing the bit that says, insert your name in the state you're in. They left that in, in the form letter they sent in. So the SEC has classified these as form letter A, B, C, and D because they know how to deal with spam. And a, they a lot of people, yeah. and a lot of people aren't really talking about the role that GBTC played in, in pushing the price of Bitcoin up in 2020 and into early 2021. Um, there yeah. was a big arbitrage opportunity that if hedge funds would would buy Bitcoin and then put those Bitcoin into the Bitcoin trust, they could then sell that on the secondary markets at a premium, you know, and that that sort of lured continually over 2020, you know, more and more money into into the Bitcoin system because they, they were buying, you know, um, they were getting issues of, of GBTC and then they'd take them, they'd sell them to retailers for a premium. 
um, and uh, that premium is no longer available. So we're sort of seeing all that happen to push up the price of Bitcoin is now operating in reverse. Oh, by the way, that um, though that money wasn't a lot of it wasn't money. A lot of it was bitcoins. You deposit bitcoins in Grayscale if you were one of their very good friends, because they mm -hmm. had to let you in. You deposit bitcoins in Grayscale, and they would then give you shares of GBTC for those bitcoins. So it wasn't even dollars. Um, Grayscale used to disclose the difference, um, but they, they stopped. stopped in 2019. Their last two reports were like 70% bitcoins, 80% bitcoins, something like that. I have been told by people who know, who would have known, that for 2020, it was basically 100% Bitcoins being deposited. Um, that's just me telling you that some guy told me. But so right. put, put on that, that one. as will. you will. Right. Yes. Uh, but but no, um, it's, it's so really... it's just, yeah, there's it's... no money. And they accounted it all in dollars. So people thought people were buying, news reports said people are putting billions of dollars into Bitcoin via Grayscale. It wasn't dollars, it was Bitcoins. Right. So, you know, as we went through everything, every, uh, you know, every every Jenga block, if you will, you know, I think that's such a great analogy to put it. Um, but, you know, after we went through each Jenga block, it seems like it all sort of comes back to around, um, you know, as each thing falls, overwhelmingly, the, you know, the sentiment, obviously, outside of crypto space, because again, you, you know, as David has always uh, said since the very, since when I first spoke with him uh, months and months and months and months ago, is that, you know, this is all, uh, you know, being that it's all really just one big Ponzi, it's all built on the fact that they need to bring new money in. And when all this is happening and you're seeing uh, company after company and token after token and, and everything fall apart, you know, the sentiment from people outside the crypto space is that I don't want to come in. I'm not going to, you know, this is, this sounds yes. ridiculous. And it, should, it of, should have, it should have really been when it should have, it should have been an end should have been put to all this in 2017. And unfortunately there just wasn't enough regulation in place. The SEC didn't come out and issue enough warnings and um, the problem just sort of exploded. And right. what we're seeing now, I mean, people are sort of reacting in horror, like how, how can this how can this be as each company, you know, another shoe drops, another shoe drops, another shoe drops. But this is sort of what's been built up since since 2017, 2018. Right. Is, is, and, and, sc and scary enough, it was just one week ago where I, I watched a clip of two sitting U.S. congressmen, two senators, Congress people, I should say, two senators, uh, U.S. Senator Kristen Gillibrand and um, and uh, Senator um, uh, Cynthia Loomis, literally stand in front of a camera and say how you know we want to uh, make uh, you know crypto, we want to classify crypto as a commodity here, which is exactly what uh, the you know the crypto companies have been uh, lobbying for to be a, a, a you know to be considered right. a, a commodity security. and not a security. And then on top of that, they're literally talking about how um, you know put your retirement funds, bet on this stuff. For your well, there was so much money, Matt, going into the crypto space. There were so many um, venture capitalists were investing into this space because they are saw investing. a path. They are investing still because they saw a path to easy money because of the lack of reg regulations, right? So the more money that flooded in, there was a lot of cash to to go and lobby politicians. And we've seen um, since 2017 so many so many people journalists that sort of all of a sudden go to the <laughs> go to the other side and become cryptocurrency promoters so you'd see i mean there were so many um stories in the media that would put a positive spin on on crypto um that would talk about new project after new project as if there was real promise and very few journalists would scratch below the surface and talk about the real story what was going on and I think that um, many, many retailers, a lot of the public has been misled about yes. the opportunities in, in Web3, the metaverse and, and crypto. And it's, it's a travesty. It's really sad. And as bad as it is now, as shocking as it is now to see what's happening, I mean, I, I don't see how it can do anything but get worse at this point. I mean, right. you've already pulled out the linchpins. I mean, it's just a matter of. I'm watching things topple over at this point, no, right? And right. and 
you know, what hasn't been talked about yet is, is the public and the retailers that are holding um, coins, thinking that Bitcoin was a hedge against inflation or they, they, they bought GBTC. It's sitting in their, their retirement accounts. And there's a lot of people that are going to get hurt. And I think we'll start to see more and more of those stories over time. And it's, it's going to be kind of sad. Out. Um, yeah. It's important to note, Luna was a disaster because retail got into Luna really heavily. You know, um, well, Mike Novogratz actually had Mike Novogratz, who 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 um, a big guy in the crypto Galaxy. space, actually had Galaxy, right? Had that big Luna Wolf tattooed on his arm, right? Right. And sent out a big tweet about that <laughs> during COVID. When Novogratz all that, has always been reputed to be a crazy man, but he's really showing it sometimes. Right, but I mean, this is how this is how it was promoted. Like this was a real, you know, sure thing, sure investment. You know, I, I did a TV show, um, sixty Minutes Australia, which is has the same status yep. in Australia that sixty Minutes does in the US. Right, you were sandwiched between two two crypto boosters. Yep, showing but it off. It turned their, out their the guy who interviewed me, their big houses. <laughs> the guy who interviewed me was actually burnt by Luna, ah. which I didn't know during the interview. He said, "So, what do you think of the people who lost money?" Oh, that's said, me. <laughs> I left. Do you think it's their fault? And you laugh. And I said, well, you know, there's a lot of tragedies here. And I talked about the suicide hotline on the Terra Luna subreddit and stuff like that. And a lot of people, I mean, to some extent, if you're a crypto degen and you should know better, you knew better. I'm actually surprised how sanguine these guys are, you know. They went, lol, lost everything again, wrecked again. But um, a lot of ordinary people who was sold this stuff people. by the failures of the media to protect the public interest. That's right. Like, it is not a balanced opinion to say, let's come to a balanced opinion between the public and right. the crooks. Maybe we can yeah. push a half crook position. That'd be very balanced. Yeah. Right. And right. I don't think it is, you know. Right. I can't. Um, I can't tell you how many reporters I had talked to over over the years that would ask me. You know, you seem you know a little negative about cryptocurrency. Is there something positive in that? Can you see something? They were always looking for the the bright side. You the know, pseudo balanced what? opinion. Because yeah. you know, um, I mean, you know, I can supply a balanced opinion. Bitcoin has scammed a lot of people. A lot of people have had their lives destroyed. And it's burnt a country's worth of electricity. But on the other hand, I've sold a lot of books. So who can say if it's good or bad, really? <laughs> right. Yeah, your your piece is uh, titled uh, The Latecomer's Guide to Crypto Crashing, which is a, a not well, it so was a subtle... great It was a great title that needed a, a story, right? So... Right. It was, suggested yes. by some, it was suggested by someone on Twitter. I went, damn it. I, Amy said, now we can use this. And so she started the piece, which we finished up yesterday. Yep. Collaborating that, turns out to be a very good way of getting us off our backsides. It's it's useful. Yes, right. And so, yeah, you know, for people who don't know, the title is a not so subtle a subtle dig, uh, dig at uh, a piece, the late comer's guide to crypto in the New York Times that did exactly what you both were just talking the, about. <clears throat> reprehensible puff piece by a journalist who the previous month had been tweeting a long stream about how journalists should totally be allowed to write about crypto having invested in it, which is forbidden by non clown shoes financial media that is none of the crypto press right so uh let me just ask you guys one more question because you're both working on an nft uh, a book on nfts the history of nfts together yeah. so uh to 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 close here let's <laughs> that's been going on for a while <laughs> yeah let, let me ask you this let me ask you this amy um because you know you came on this show to talk about the bored apes previously so uh amid, amid this whole crypto crash how are the poor apes doing How's the NFT market holding up? I I'm guessing not very well. Floor, I haven't I haven't checked the floor price of the apes yet, but there's uh, New York NFT week is happening next week. So um, <laughs> oh, that great should be timing. a big party. Right, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, if you want to go to Ape Fest though. Um, the floor guess, price today is 76 Ether, which is currently $84,000. Oh, wow. A bargain to attend one of those parties. That's it's a little bit cheaper. lower than it was before, but hey, you can get it into a party. So get them yeah, on. Yeah, it's can. sort of Buy up and downing gift. like a yo yo. Let's look at the month <laughs> chart. Oh, that's not very good, is it? Yeah, that one is the big one. <laughs> you. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, journalist Amy Caster, author of, uh, of uh, Attack of the 50 Foot Blockchain, David Gerard. 
thank you so much for joining me to break down what the hell's been going on, uh, really, over thank the past you, couple of weeks. Uh, thank well, you for having me. What, what, where can people uh, find you online and follow your work? Uh, go ahead. Well, I, I'm at amycaster.com, and I, I just want to remind you that we both have um, Patreon accounts. And, um, you know, we the support that comes through really does mean a lot. It really helps. So, you know, please, yes. uh, if we you accept. like our work, support us. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm very long on GBP, my favorite shitcoin. <laughs> disreputable shit point it's it's taken a bit of a beating but its merchant story is amazing right right yeah and i hear it's, the transactions are lightning fast too they are they are it's good um i even have a gbp ca credit card it's amazing but yes um so amy's ah caster on twitter she didn't manage to grab amy caster i yeah. managed to grab david gerard uh, and david gerard.co.uk um if you search for david gerard bitcoin you'll find me there you go um, yeah he's easy to find all right david and amy thank you so much and, thank you uh, have a great day and okay, let's see what too. happens tomorrow we'll probably have to do another yeah. of these all oh, right yes absolutely every day something new take care Christ. okay <laughs> have fun. Bye. oh man and that was just some of the things we were able to bring up in this sort of summarized latecomers guide as David and Amy called it. Be sure to follow them on Twitter, check out their work. And if you have uh, extra cash to support them, definitely go and check out their Patreon pages and uh, give them some, uh, some love. And here on Scam Economy, we will be continuing to monitor all these separate Jenga pieces, as well as the whole tower. We'll, we'll likely do a Scam Economy episode focusing more in detail on at least some of these aspects we've talked about you know celsius is one that's just on my mind right now and i'm sure in a in a couple of weeks if not sooner there'll be more about three arrows to talk about so scameconomy.com for you know that's where you can find all the links to everything also a great easy sole link to share to friends, family members to let them know about this show. Uh, if you can support monetarily, patreon.com slash Matt Binder is always a big help in helping me grow this show out. Uh, if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, go to twitch.tv, log in, connect your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account, and Amazon gives you a free Twitch Prime subscription every month. That's right, a free paid subscription to your favorite Twitch creator. There is, you know, one, you know, the uh, addendum here. You have to manually renew every month uh, when the month ends. That Twitch Prime subscription just expires and doesn't automatically renew. So be sure to give it back to me or whoever you're giving it to or someone new when that subscription lapses. YouTube.com slash Matt Binder. Uh, subscribe to the channel. I live stream on both uh, at least uh, twice a week. I'll be going live right after this episode of Scam Economy if you're watching the YouTube premiere or you're catching the podcast the moment it goes up on Thursday night. And you could always go back and check out the replays as well if you didn't catch it live on um, YouTube and Twitch. I also take calls during the live stream. Just open up Skype if you have Skype or just go to Skype on the web. You don't need to download it and search username doomed live. And you can call into the show. I take the calls as they come in. No screening, nothing like that. Just first come, first serve. And we could have a conversation about whatever you'd like. Crypto, politics, uh, pro wrestling, punk rock, whatever. Follow me on Twitter, at Matt Binder. Just search for me on social media anywhere, Matt Binder, and you can probably find me. Uh, leave Apple Podcast and Spotify reviews if you haven't already. They are a big help in getting new eyeballs onto the show because those reviews help the show work up the rankings. And be sure to check out my other show, Doomed, at doomedcast.com. And also the video version of that show goes up on YouTube and Twitch as well. So if you're following me on there, you'll, you'll, you'll be notified for both shows real easily. And with that, I mean, I wish I could actually tell you guys what I think the next episode will be in advance, but I prefer to not like record so far ahead uh, because this stuff is so quick moving. It's just always something new. What's promoted as the next big thing one day is outed as a giant Ponzi scheme that's already falling apart at the very next. Uh, so, you know, 
stay tuned, subscribe to me, and follow me on all those different social media platforms. And that's really the best way to find out what the hell's going on on the scam economy.